single lets, young professionals, single again tenants, job relocation tenants, short lets, holiday lets, family lets, housing benefit tenants. It's all so confusing. Have you ever wondered what type of tenant brings in the most profit? Gives you the least amount of stress, pays on time every time, and gives you the passive income that you expected from property? Fear not, my friends. In this video, I will explain every tenant type, what I think about the tenant type, what property types and strategies suit those tenant types, and which ones I believe are gonna be really good for the next year and onwards, giving you the property investment that you truly hoped for. Understanding your tenant types is hugely underrated. Firstly, you cannot go and have a strategy in property without understanding the tenant that will end up in that property. It's very different in terms of how you finish a property between a housing benefit tenant and a high-end serviced accommodation, Airbnb let. They're gonna be worlds apart and that's gonna affect your margins and the income and where that income comes from is also gonna be different. You cannot simply just hit and hope when it comes to taking on properties. The more we understand our exit, the better we're gonna be able to purchase and purchase well with an exact idea on who we are catering for during this process. I'm not gonna to delve too deep into the tenancy agreements because they are vast and they are complicated, but I'll do that in a separate video. I'm simply going to highlight the different types of tenants, some of which you probably don't know exist, the benefits, the negatives, the pros, the cons, to allow you to make an educated decision on who you want to let your properties to and who you're gonna build a portfolio around. I do recommend that you mix up tenancies because like anything, we wanna spread our risk. If you go into student let specifically and that's all you ever do, and something happens to the student market, which we've seen recently, then all of your eggs are in one basket. So we always recommend trying to split your properties across various different tenant types. Let's start with the easy one. The single let property. Now people, absolutely, the old school investor loves this one. This is where we buy a two or three bed property and we stick a nice family in there who have good credentials in terms of earnings and they will stay there forever causing you no problems ever and it will pay your mortgage and a bit and you'll sail off into the sunset. The problem with this is that it just doesn't work anymore. It kind of can, but it's also a really rubbish way of using your money in my opinion. Mortgage rates, cost of acquisition, cost of property have all gone up massively in the last couple of decades, rendering the single let tenancy almost pointless for investors. And this is why you're finding queues of people trying to find property because investors are trying to, or having to find new ways of increasing the income in their property. The, the, the rents have gone up huge amounts, which is almost impossible for families to even afford them. And it's still barely covering the cost of the mortgage. You've also got section 24, the tax, which means that a landlord can't even claim back the interest on their mortgage anymore. Therefore, 100% of the rental is considered income, means that the strategy is very tough to make work for investors, and therefore, most are going elsewhere. However, I'm gonna give you the pros of this strategy anyway, so that you understand who it's suitable for and why. So again, I did mention this. If you get the right family who have, I mean, the problem is, is there's no real solid jobs anymore. Everyone's getting sacked left, right and centre. Um, companies are using AI instead of humans and whatever else. But anyway, a stable income from a family where they should stay for a long period of time is what people truly want from a single X strategy. In most cases, a three bed family home is gonna be needed, required, always. It's a good sized property that isn't way over budget for a small family, but is also enough space, usually with a garden, etc. It's a nice portfolio property to have if you can make the numbers work. Maintenance is also relatively easy. You're gonna have a standard boiler in there. If you go four or five bedrooms, you're gonna have to start looking into different heating options and things like that. Whereas a three bed terraced home is gonna be relatively simple, typically the same problems, therefore you can preempt them and it gives you that quiet tenant that you've been looking for. Now the cons, I've gone into these in the detail. You can tell that I'm not a big fan of this strategy. It's quite frankly boring. I think there's much better places you could put your money rather than the stress and hassle of having to buy a property to then not make that much money and then having to hope and pray that the 
value of that property goes up over time, which it might do depending on the area, it might not. Um, so yeah, the, the cons are the low profits to be made. If you're buying with a mortgage and you're buying to build a portfolio, you're gonna be dealing with high mortgage rates, high cost of acquisition, including stamp duty and such, and that is gonna render your profits to be small. Another downside is families. I don't know, it always, always wound me up when people go, oh, just get a nice family in there that's gonna look after the property. I am a family man, I have two children. Let me tell you one thing that they don't do. Look after your fucking property. They draw on walls, they shit on floors, they smash things up because they think it's funny. Um, they throw things around, they stick things on walls and ceilings that you can't get down. It is far from the perfect tenant. And that is fine because that's just what families do. It doesn't mean it's a bad family, but you have to be aware that this tenant is not low maintenance. You are gonna find a property potentially not in as good a condition as it was before they went in because they are a normal family in which have children who run around and do stupid things. Secondly, they're probably gonna have a dog or a cat or something or want one of those things. And again, that causes damage. Finally, you may have to focus this strategy around schooling. A lot of people will actually move to a rental specifically for the catchment area of a school. So if your property isn't within one, you're unlikely to get as high a rent as you would within one. I don't particularly think that's a huge con as such, but it's something to keep in your mind if you're looking down this strategy. So to summarize, a single let family property, I think, is a poor investment, especially for those wanting to build a portfolio. If you've built a portfolio and you just want to put your money somewhere and you know how property works, then it's probably a good one for you. You're lowly, you're, you're lowly, you're low leverage with your property portfolio, maybe reducing that amount of leverage down and you want consistent, nice rentals that come in. Again, for me, just not the one. Young professionals in a single let property. So this is probably going to be a couple or a few friends that wanna take on a one or two bedroom apartment or house somewhere outside of London. Young professionals are typically gonna want much higher levels, much higher specs so they can do videos and tell everyone how great they are. They are hard work in my experience. They want the most, they know that they're paying really good rent and therefore they do not just accept rubbish like landlords used to be able to get away with. That's not a bad thing by the way, but just be aware that they're gonna expect a lot. Another downside is that they don't want to do much. If a light bulb needs changing, they're probably gonna ask you to do so because they're paying such high rent, so you can go ahead and do it. Typically, these guys are sporadic. They might, they're early on in their careers. They might wanna change jobs, change place. They might just want a bigger, better place. They might, if they're in with a friend, might go and find a girlfriend or boyfriend and then go off with them you're unlikely to get the longevity that you would with a family home. So while talking about the pros, I've already gone into a con, they're, they're likely to move on quite quickly. A second con would be that they, they typically will want the higher end things. They'd want the Alexas and the um, smart stuff within the property. They want to feel like they're doing well by paying you all this money. And in my head, while I'm talking to you about this, I've got a London apartment in my head, don't ask me why, but that's the kind of young professional going into that kind of place, being able to shove off to their mates and you know, out of uni style students. They're gonna be good payers, earning good money out of university or similar, but they're gonna be high demanding tenants in my opinion. So to summarize on the young professional in a single let property, I think it's better than a family, quite frankly. They're not gonna have the kids to smash stuff up. They're not gonna have the wear and tear running up and down the stairs like you do with kids. However, you are more likely to have the parties and therefore potentially have to deal with neighbor complaints and things like that. Um, you are also gonna get the high demand from them wanting the next new thing or wanting to you to molly coddle them because they can't do anything themselves because they've been at uni for four years. The third one that we can put into a single let property would be social housing in the form of housing benefit. This one is often overlooked. It's not my favorite because it's very, very difficult when you're a trusting man like myself. I always get in trouble by from my wife who says, I'm way too trusting, I trust everyone. Everything anyone says, I rely on a handshake and I go, wow, this is gonna be great, never happens. So when you do housing benefit, you have to look into the eye of the housing benefit tenant and ask them questions and hope they tell the truth. And if they do, you give them a chance. That is the best way I can describe it. There are a lot of good people on housing benefit. 
especially now where times are really hard. And I don't wanna discourage anyone from renting two people just because they're on housing benefit, but just understand the type of people you could end up with. People down on their luck, people potentially with bad mental health, not bad enough for it to be documented. But you know, if you're on housing benefit, it means you've not got a job or the job that you'd like. They're, they're not with friends or family or, or, or a partner and potentially just down on their luck, potentially have just had a fall from grace and that they're just getting back on their feet. And that's the hope. The, the, the potential is that that's not the case and it could be a downward spiral, which could lead to drugs, alcohol abuse, etc., and worse mental health issues. And as a landlord, we're not qualified to deal with this stuff and the government and councils need to do more. But um, I'll go into the supported side of tenancies on the next bit, but just be aware of the housing benefit. Housing benefit actually don't pay too badly and there are some benefits of doing it. Some councils do pay um, bit la relatively large fees, I think 5,000 pounds in some councils to, for you to take on a tenant, but it's hard to get this right. So if you're gonna go down this route and you want to because you want to help certain people, then firstly applaud you and, and I hope you do that. But maybe go via a, a letting agency who has experience in this. They're gonna be able to see through the ones that are pulling the wool over your eyes and basically just trying to get a drug den off you compared to the ones that are legitimately just wanting a new start to their life before they can go and get that job and the next steps to rebuild. That's probably the way I would go with it. And without saying the pros and cons, I've pretty much said them. The, good, the pros are that if you know what you're doing, you can be paid directly from council slash government. Um, they have changed the rules, but you can with the tenant signing certain documentation, receive the, the money directly. So make sure that you look into that. However, the cons are vast. You can just be stitched up by people who lie blatantly to your face and have no intention of paying you. Some of them will go ahead and cancel their, their benefits and leave you without payment. Some of them will trash the property and it's really hard to get it back. So there, in my opinion, there's a lot more cons than there are pros to it. And I think that's the big problem that the councils and governments have. They're not doing enough to make this enough of a pro for us to get involved and buy property for this demographic. So that that's my opinion. And that leads me perfectly onto supported and social housing with government, council, housing association contracts. A very big difference. Now, if you've watched any of my other videos, you know that that is all we do in our business. Social housing and supported living is it. That is everything. Because firstly, we want to house 1 million vulnerable people in the UK. But secondly, I want to be able to do that by focusing on what we're good at, i.e. finding houses for people. I don't want to then have to go to every tenant that we're about to move in and hope he's not lying to me or she's not lying to me and deal with mental health issues and drug issues, alcohol issues, all these other problems that may arise because I am not qualified for that and I don't have the time to do so. I'm focused on finding the property for these people, not to then manage them afterwards. So a supported living lease or a social housing lease will typically give you three to 25 year leases and they will take care of the maintenance of the property, the management of the tenant. If there's any voids, they will pay us anyway. They, anyway, they will pay us anyway if there's any voids. They will deal with any tenant-based problems within the property. So if a tenant breaks a door off of the kitchen, they will be made to fix that. They also will, depending on the contract, in most cases, they'll put the property back in its original condition, including the wear and tear. So this is a really good option for those of you who want to, one, be a part of helping people that are vulnerable and require help without having to be too involved in the lives of others. The other benefit is that you're gonna be dealing with a company. Now, you wanna make sure that you're checking out the lease and checking out those, the company credentials. How long have they been around? Have they just been knocked up yesterday? Make sure that they actually have the financial backing to be able to commit to the money that they're committing to. After that, you've got a pretty clear run of your tenant. So, so in a single let property for social or supported living, there are vast amounts required. You will do very, very well if you can try and make them accessible for wheelchair users. There are high rents offered to those who have wider doorways, lowered um, desktops and things like that, and a real sense of doing something good. And I think that's really underestimated in the property world. So we can get really good rents, a very quiet tenant, and know that you're helping someone who has struggled to find a property. So in terms of the cons with your supported and social housing is that in social, which could be asylum seekers, it could be 
I mean, it could be a very variant of things, but people automatically go into the asylum seeker mindset and you could have some pushback on why you're doing that, why not house your own, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't bother me. If it doesn't bother you, great, crack on. Um, the supported living is a little more complex. There's a lot of stakeholders involved in the process. There's a lot of potential, a lot of time that could it could take for you to go from accepting an offer through to actually being paid. Once it's done, it's, it's, a, it's a dream, but it can take a little while. So we always recommend going and putting your properties out there as early as you can when you buy the property so that even if you've got a relatively big refurb, you can be having the conversations with the providers during that process. I'm gonna stick a link in below to our partners, Supported Living Gateway. They act as a matchmaker between somebody with a property and a lease provider, Supported Living Social Housing, who need a property to lease. We will help you in the middle. We'll teach you about what the different contracts are, anything that we'd be aware of, and then basically help you get to the point in which you're getting paid your rent. So make sure you click that link below and check out the Supported Living Gateway. Now we are onto our HMOs, houses of multiple occupancy. These are typically known or thought of as student lets. They are where you will have multiple rooms with a shared kitchen and a shared bathroom. Some HMOs will have all en suite bathrooms. They're individual bathrooms and only share a kitchen, but it all depends. So let's start with students. Students are becoming less. So student lets have always been very, very popular for investors. This is because typically their parents will act as guarantors for them for the money that they need to pay. And if they don't pay, their parents will have to. Most will pay upfront. So that's another big benefit. You've got all of your rent upfront for that year. And they will also have the benefit of only being in for 10 months, not 12. So you always get a couple of months where you can make some maintenance changes or upgrade the property without having to lose on your monthlies. You don't have to pay council tax typically because students are exempt or at least massively reduced and the bills are also paid for by those students. So there are a lot of pros involved in this. Now, the negatives are you will have every single one of those houses used for party accommodation. I would recommend you just accept that and you try and make it partyable and try and make sure that that kitchen, the flooring, etc., can take a lot of vodka and beer on the floor and it's wiped downable and cleanable and hard to break. So that is just part and parcel of it. And it's best that you sort of understand that early on. The other negative is that students are on site less. So since COVID, people have realized they can learn online. The cost of going to university is spiraling out of control and people are also starting to realize that going to university isn't a route for them anymore and that the money and the debt that they're getting into to go to university quite frankly isn't worth it and they're going to pursue other types of careers this is meaning that the lower end accommodation in the student end are struggling now if you're going to a student area and you're building something great and a product that is suitable and it's inspiring and it's making people feel like the money they're spending is worthwhile you're probably going to be fine but the lower end stuff which is a lot of what we take on for our supported living and social housing tenants for me i wouldn't do it because i don't want to have to maintain my property every single 10 months when it gets trashed i don't want to have to go through the claim process of getting money back for those works and it would worry me the amount of competition that is happening now. And for that reason, I wouldn't go for it. However, I can completely understand why many do. Now I'm gonna end up repeating myself a little bit here, so I'm gonna try not to, but young professionals in an HMO as well. These are similar stories. So in my experience, they want the best room for the best price. And when they get the best price, they want you to do everything for them, especially if you're including all of your bills. So most of the professional lets, the downside of them compared to the students is that you're gonna to have to include the bills into that. Now, the problem with that is that during the winter, your bills are gonna be high. During the summer, they're gonna be lower. And it's quite difficult to kind of gauge where your room rents need to be to average out over time. The other downside is that because it's all inclusive, they feel like they want to use it. We're constantly dealing with people going to work, turning the radiators on throughout the house, thermostat up and leaving windows open on purpose, purely to use it because they knew we were paying for it. It's a crazy mindset to have. This was many years ago, so I'm hoping people are a little more aware of how bad that is for the environment and not just for our pocket. 
but that was a problem we dealt with. Another issue is people, random people living together. You're gonna deal with people that play buckaroo with the bins, leave the banana skin on the top and run off hoping someone will take it. And then you'll get complaints about the maggots that will inevitably turn up in the, in the summer. You're also gonna have playing music too late, smoke in their rooms, party. All of these problems happen with young professionals as well. And I found it a really, really tough demographic. Yes, they paid really good rents because again, they're working and they want the, the high end level. But as a tenant type, I found them really hard work to actually manage. Um, so just be aware of that. Now again, a huge one for me, supported in social housing in the HMO sector is massive. The rents we receive because the social housing provider will take on the entirety of the home and agree to a room rate, which has no voids because they pay us no matter what. There will be no voids, no maintenance, no ma no, we don't have to pay any of the heating bills, the electric, the gas, the anything. So what they pay us is a net figure. Whatever we can make from that will be net for the duration of the term. This is what drove me from the professionals I just moaned about into the supported and social housing was the HMOs, the ability for us to get a really good margin on those rooms and yet removes all of the downside to HMO property investing. The downsides are massive because you've got random people living together. You've got to deal with that dynamic. You've then got, what if somebody leaves? You've then got an empty room. You've got to try and get that person in the room and then probably do some painting and some upgrading. And there's gonna be void periods and it's really hard to average those across. We've supported a social housing, you get paid every single month from a company or a housing association or a charity every single month no matter what means you can sleep easy serviced accommodation or airbnb if you don't understand what service accommodation service accommodation is the ability for us to short let so it won't be under the normal tenancy agreement it will be under a short let tenancy agreement which has different rules entirely there are actually most people think this is just stick it on airbnb booking.com and off you go with dealing with tourists but there's actually quite a few different types of tenants that you can have in short let properties and this is again really important for you to understand so that you know how to actually renovate the property, how to get it to the level that you want it to be for the end tenant. There is no point in this to a massively high level risk to then rent it out to a load of builders. It's just not worth it. The builders will be uncomfortable in this fluffy, I don't know, I'm imagining like a girly flat here, but um, they're gonna be uncomfortable. They wanna be in a place in which they can kick their boots off, sit on a sofa, wipe it down afterwards and get a good night's sleep. They don't want all these mod cons and these nice things. It will, all, it will just make them feel uncomfortable. So first of those is contractors. Contractors just want to come in after a hard day's graft, kick off their boots. They don't want to have to worry about getting mess on carpet or lovely stuff. And then they want to grab some food, a cup of tea, maybe some beers, watch the telly. Maybe even a little idea would be to put a PlayStation or an Xbox in there and they can just relax and chill before Guy in a bed, make sure the bed's comfy as well. Again, the bed frame doesn't have to be anything special, but just make sure the actual bed is comfy because they're gonna very much value their sleep. They're gonna be really grafting hard. So make sure that we look after them in that sense and that they'll be happy people. Otherwise, they're gonna be too worried about getting stuff dirty and mucky and breaking things and whatever else. So just make sure it's fit for purpose. It really, really is important. Now the downside to it is that this project could finish and we wanna make sure that there are multiple exits here. So if you've used rent to rent, for instance, great, because we can end the lease as and when that project finishes. If you own, then I assume that the property worked in another, with another tenant type previously so maybe when the project ends we'll just go back to that tenant type um, but we just it's just well worth being aware of these things and going about your strategy strategically doesn't make any sense but you know what I mean it's really important to do it's a great demographic with your short let stays as you're going to be like I say you're going to be paid by the company and you go directly to that company for any issues, any problems, and it's typically gonna be relatively well looked after because they're gonna wanna return week after week anyway. Now you've got your corporate stays. This isn't a million miles away, but in terms of how you finish the property, it really is. The corporate stay is still gonna be paid by the company to you, typically. It may be actually the person living there has an allowance that he's paid and he pays you, but typically it's gonna be the, um, the company themselves that pay you. Now, the good thing about this is that the employee 
who is working for the company that is staying in your property will want to look after that property because the last thing they want is you as the owner going back to them and saying, the, pl the bloke completely ruined our property, here are the pictures. It's gonna be very embarrassing for them. So typically they're gonna really look after this place. We want the, the, the finish of this property to be relatively high. We want it to have all the mod cons, we want it to have things like Alexa in there, we want it to have things like a really good alarm clock I think is great. So I, I always used to put in the sunshine, the sunrise alarm clock. So I don't know if you've seen those, I've got one um, myself and it basically emulates the sun rising rather than playing music it emulates the sun rising it wakes you up lovely and naturally and you feel alive that is a really cool little extra again you know they're gonna have to use the alarm and wake up relatively early so if you can think about them it's gonna be a really good thing for them to go oh, do you know what that's such a nice little extra they didn't need to do so a completely different finish to the contractor side of things but kind of similar in some ways as well um, make sure you've got blackout curtains always make sure the room can be completely dark good duvets, good mattresses, make sure that the sleep is just incredible and they will return on that basis alone. The downside to this demographic, obviously, is gonna be the high cost of finish. With all those extra mod cons and what have you, it will cost, however, they're gonna be paying really well for that as well and you'll get the consistency of the income, hopefully, some longer stays as well. So I think it more, for, more than makes up for the additional expense. And finally, we have the Airbnb, the short stay, the tourist market, the worst of all, in my opinion. So I find it really hard to kind of go, I can see why people do that, because I've been through this, I've done this, and it was awful. We had fraudulent bookings being used. They go and steal somebody's card, and they book, and you go for all these normal checks, and they pull the wool over your eyes relatively easy. You know, there's only so many questions you can ask, and, We've had drug deals happen. We've had them order stuff off the internet back to our properties. We've had the police called multiple times where they've um, just got away with it. Smash TVs, laughing gas canisters, drugs everywhere. We've had it all. And this was across various sites that we had and it was almost impossible to stop. You don't get that with the contractor or the corporate stays. You just don't get that. And it's a really tough, tough, tough market because it's the one thing when people coach service accommodation, they will coach you on how to use Airbnb to get short lets, one night, two night stays. The problem with that is if your cleaner doesn't turn up, then the following stay is gonna move into a dirty one, bad review. Even if you sort it out relatively quickly, it's not a good look. So you're constantly under pressure to get things sorted really quickly like a hotel would, but you're not a hotel. And it is really tough really tough so i i'm not even going to tell you there's any pros or cons my advice just leave that well alone there are going to be some really big operators who are able to have customer service reps they're going to have big cleaning contracts with cleaners on hand at any one point maintenance men all of this stuff they're going to have in place because they're a big operator if you're just starting out you are the operator and you will find yourself extremely stressed out and I just do not advise it. So you're not gonna get a polarized view of uh, Airbnb investing from me. It's gonna be a straight, do not do it. I do not recommend it. There are a million better ways of making money in property than shortlets. Right, and finally, I'm gonna give you a little bonus one. So this is a little trick using the housing benefit. Now the housing benefit, is a very strange beast, very complicated. However, we coined many years ago the term two squared model. Two squared is a derivative of the two plus two model. I just thought I'd change the name and make it mine and it kind of kicked off a little bit. But anyway, what it is, is the ability for us to get two times the one bedroom rate on housing benefit rather than using the shared rate, which is typically low. So the way we do this is, and again, don't ask me why they've done it, but if we have an over 35 year old who is single on housing benefit, we can give them access, sole access to two rooms within a property, and they will be able to claim the one bedroom rate, not the shared rate. Cool thing about this, with a three bedroom property, means we can have two of those people getting the one bedroom rate. So the reason it's called the two squared model is because two people in the property, having access to two rooms each means that you get two times the one bedroom rate and it's a really big increase. So you're probably looking at HMO returns with single occupancy property, meaning you can get around the Article 4 derivative which stops you from turning 
properties into HMOs. So you're gonna be able to just have two people in there, so they consider that a family. That, that is, even if it's too unrelated, you're not gonna to have to get an HMO license, but we're gonna get much increased income. Therefore, we're gonna be able to not have to do tons of fireworks, fire rated works, etc., and be able to get just two individuals in who will also, the other big benefit, they will typically stay for a much longer time than any other tenant type because they are single, they are over 35, and they are gonna get a really nice property with a garden, with a nice kitchen. They're not gonna be wedged into a room. They're gonna get two rooms all by themselves and then shared amenities such as bathroom, kitchen, and a garden. So really cool tip there. If you wanna look into that, I really recommend that one. Again, you're gonna have the same negatives as the normal housing benefit stuff I talked to you about. You're gonna to have to really try and get some trust from them and get them to answer you in the right way and hope that they're just good people. That's the negatives, but there are a lot of benefits to that too. So I hope you like that bonus tip and all of the other tips I've given you. If you've got any questions, if I've confused you with anything, hit the comment in below and make sure you're subscribing, hitting the bell icon so that you're aware of any other videos that I release and I'll see you soon.